So for this bell work, we just want to know which of the which of these two graphs has the greater y-intercept. I don't care the one's linear. I don't care the one's exponential. I don't care about that. The only thing I care about is where the y-intercept is. So let's identify those. For graph A, I've got this y-intercept. Remember, the y-intercept is where this blue line is going to cross over or through this y-axis, which is the vertical number line. And that gives me this ordered pair here at 0, negative 4. But then for our exponential graph, graph B, again, I see that this blue line curves into the y-axis, the vertical number line here. And this would be the ordered pair. Okay, 0, positive 3. So really, all we're comparing is negative 4 and positive 3. Which one's bigger? And for that one, that would be 0, negative 3. So that means that which graph has a greater y-intercept? We're looking at graph B. Here's our objective for the day. I can find domain and range for maps, graphs, ordered pairs, and tables, and I can determine if a relation is a function. Take 30 seconds, copy this down. Whether you notice this or not, some of this stuff, well, maybe we haven't done this stuff before, but none of this stuff is going to require you to calculate anything, okay? So this is a nice way to come back from a Christmas break. All, both of these objectives are, can you just look at the function? Can you look at what's there and then make these determinations? There's no calculating involved in any of this stuff. You could if you wanted to, but you don't have to, okay? For example, if they were to give us a table, we know how to make an equation from that, whether it's exponential or linear. Uh, but not all of these are going to be linear or even necessarily exponential. They can be kind of weird looking, and that's okay too. Uh, but these are our two objectives for the day. So if you can get these two objectives down by the end of the lesson, you're in good shape. The assignment should, should go very, very, very well for you. This is what we call set notation. Set notation is just listing a set of values in what we call fancy brackets. What makes these brackets fancy? They're kind of curved, right? Like if you see in parentheses, parentheses just look like this, which kind of, you know, you could say that's classy because they have some curvature. But this one has a little bit more curvature, okay? And then we've seen these before also where you have square brackets like this, which we will see again. Um, but those aren't fancy at all, right? But these ones, these ones that we have right here, super fancy, because they are curved, lots of curves. In fact, uh, in order to make them, so if I wanted to open up a set of fancy brackets, I would make an S and then a 2. Now, okay, well, Mr. Sal, your fancy brackets kind of suck right there. Well, that's I'm just trying to show you how to do it if you don't know how to do it, okay? So it's an S and a 2. That's to open them up, and then when you want to close them, you're going to do that backwards. You're going to do a 2, then you're going to do an S. Now, you see the ones that close are a little bit more fancy because the curvature looks very nice. One that opens up, yeah, not so nice. But it's okay. It's just, we're just trying to show you how to do this because on a test, if you ever need fancy brackets like this, if you don't put them in there, minus a point. So keep that in mind. And all we're doing is listing values. So in between these, you could have numbers like 5 or negative 1 or 8, something like this. Uh, but it doesn't have to be numbers. You can list just regular values. Like, I don't know, socks, shoes, schmocks, whatever, right? You can put in this fancy brackets, whatever you want. It's just listing values or things. So, of course, we're in a math class. So we're expecting numbers. All right, so we've seen lots of graphs. We've seen uh, tables. Seems like we've seen some mappings. Either way, we have to know what a function is. So let's see what this says. Uh, when every x value has only one corresponding y value. Uh, by the way, this is simplified from what the real nerdy version is. If you want to know what the real nerdy version is, Google it. But it may put you to sleep by the time you finish, okay? So you're looking at every x value. If an x value has different y values coming out of it, then it would be considered not a function, okay? So it has to have only one corresponding y value on these. So, yeah, it says uh, if an x value shows two corresponding y values, the relation relationship is not a function, ordered pairs, order pairs may repeat, y values may, may repeat as well. Yeah, none of that matters for the functions, uh, but if the ordered pair do, does repeat for x values and the corresponding y values, it would be a function. 
So you may see this on the assignment. Y is a function of X. It's the same as saying that the output is a function of the input. Now, output and input may be new to us. So if you look at an ordered pair, which is usually with parentheses and a comma, we know that the first value is an X value. And then the second value would be a Y value. Okay, so that's what we're used to seeing, but now they're going to change the vocabulary because math people aren't very nice. But the X value is what we call input and the Y value is what we call output. So it's like taking a machine and if you put something in, you need to know what comes out. Okay, so to demonstrate this, if, if I have an ordered pair, let's say uh, five one, Okay, so I just made these numbers up. They don't matter where they come from. It's just an ordered pair. So this means I would put in five. That's my input. And then I would put five into to a machine, and then out comes a one. Hey, that's pretty cool, right? But if I go back to that machine and I put in a five, what should I expect to come out? I should expect a one to come out. If I go to the machine and I put in a five, and out comes anything but one, because before over here, I see that I put in a five and out comes a one. Every time I put in a five, I should get a one out. Okay, so if it, if it ends up being something different, it would not be a function, but this right now is showing that we are looking at a function. Now, can you put other things into the machine? Yes, you can, but again, whatever you put in, you have to get the same thing out no matter what. That is how you will know that it is a function. This is a function machine. So you see, um, they used to animate this stuff and I used to think it was really cool because I'm a math nerd. But right here, let's say that I put in a two. Okay, so I put in a two and this would be from an ordered pair. So I'm gonna put in a two and then let's say out comes four. Okay, that's pretty good, right? Let's say it was dollars even, right? I put in this machine two dollars and out comes four dollars. That's pretty good. Okay, so that happened, and we've recorded it here as an ordered pair, 2, 4. But then I go back to the machine, and I've got a $2 bill again, and I put it in, and then out comes $4 again, right? Well, that's pretty cool. Every time I put in $2 into this machine, it tells me that I'm going to get $4 out. Now, what if I come back to this machine and I say, look, I'm gonna put $2 in this time because I really like getting $4 out. Well, this time the machine says, you know what, you get $8 this time. Now, I might, I might be happy about that, but I don't know what the crap is going on with this machine, right? So now it's malfunctioning and then it would not be function. So just with these two ordered pairs here, it is a function, but now that I put $2 in and then now come an eight, $8, which I like, um, it's not a function anymore, okay? Because I don't know what's going on in this machine. It looked like every time I put in a two, out comes a four. It looks pretty good. Now let's let's go back a little bit, okay? So let's let's take these values away. So right now, the way that I have it, these two values, two four ordered pairs, this works. Now let's say that I put in a three right here. So again, as an ordered pair, this would be three, but then out comes a six. Now, I may even determine what is happening with this machine, right? I put in $3 and then it gives me $6 back. It looks like it's just doubling whatever I put in, right? So if I put in, I would put, want to put in as much as I can. So let's say that I go back to this machine. I say, I'm going to put in $10. Can I expect to know how much is going to come out? Yeah, because of its function, it looks like it's doubling every time. So out comes $20, yeah, it's functioning very, very well. And I know exactly what I can expect as I put stuff into this machine. As of right now, we know how this machine works. We should also be able to write a function or an equation for it. Looking at this relationship right here, um, we wanna know if it's a function. Is this a function? Well, to know if it's a function, right here, I put in negative 12. Now, if I look at all the other x values, if I look at the other x values, there's no other x values that are going to indicate that if I put in negative 12, something different comes out because these other inputs or x values are all different. 
Okay, so negative 12, it checks off. What about 13? Well, there's no other 13s to contradict it. Some students would say negative 13 is the same. It's not. Positive 13 and negative 13, they are different. So you can't say that they're, they are the same. But, but right here, it's showing that if you put in 13, you get out negative 10. But there's nothing to contradict that to make it seem like it's not functioning. The same is true if you put in 4, if you put in 8, or if you put in negative 13. There's nothing to contradict this or to show that if you put any of these values in, you're going to get something different out. So this one right here, is it a function? Yes, a function. Now, I'm writing here that it is a function. On the homework, it'll say, is it a function? That's a yes or no question. So the answer to this one on the assignment would be yes. Okay. On this one, I've got a 3 here in the, in the front. So that's what I put in. And then out comes negative 7. In 3, out negative 7. Well, the next x value is negative 2, and then the next one is 6. But over here at the very end, here I put in negative, uh, sorry, positive 3. But then out comes this negative 4. Okay, so I'm putting something in 3, and I'm getting different things coming out of this thing. So this one's not functioning. So again, it says determine if it is a function. On the assignment, it'll say, is it a function? And for this, we're going to just put no. And it is specifically just because of the x's being 3's, both here and here. I don't care about these two because there's no matching x's on these. So if I, if I put in negative 2, I get out 8 every time. If I put in 6, I get it out of 1 every time. But if I put in a 3, I don't know if I'm going to get negative 7 out or negative 4. So it is not a function. So fill in the blanks to make the relation a function. This is the same problem, it's just we've taken away the corresponding y values, the outputs, for the inputs of 3. Now, why are these ones blanks? It's because right here you've put in a 3, and over here you're putting in 3 as well. Now, we're trying to make this a function, so we want it to be a function. So you guys tell me a value that I can, I can put into this box right here. Yeah, thank you for using 4, because some students like, use 4 million, of which I don't want to write that many zeros. I'm a lazy math person, okay? But if this is a 4, right? So I, I put in a 3, out comes a 4, which you've chosen right here. That means over here, if I put in a 3, then out, I must also get a 4. Okay, so this has to match. This ordered pair, 3, 4, has to match this ordered pair, 3, 4, in order for this to be a function. If, since we chose this one as 4, if I put anything but 4 here, it would not be a function anymore. Okay, but it, they have to match. So even if, let's say this was a negative 4, you could make this negative 4 as well, and then it would still be a function. Okay, whatever's 3 and whatever your corresponding y value is, here has to match this one. So this is a table. The table, though, is still giving us ordered pairs. So in other words, this is 0, negative 8. This is 1, negative 7. This is negative 1, negative 6, and this is 2, negative 5. Or you could say you have your x's, which are your inputs, and then you got your y's corresponding, that's your outputs, okay? But they are corresponding, so it's not like you could have the ordered pair negative 1, negative 8, okay? But right here, I don't see any of my x values are different to indicate that if I put something in, I'm going to get something different out. Let's put that a different way. If I put in 0, I know I'm going to get negative 8. If I put in 1, I get negative 7. And 1 and negative 1, here for my inputs, they are different. So if I put in negative 1, I get negative 6. If I put in 2, I get negative 5. Some students were showing that uh, they were worried that this went 0, 1, and then negative 1, and then positive. It doesn't matter that how this is, um, the, like the, the pattern in the x's. It doesn't matter. Uh, I don't have anything to show that my outputs are going to be different from what I put in. So is the relation a function? Again, on the, on the assignment, you would put... Yes. Once again, we do have our inputs. Right? That's this column. That's my X column, inputs. And then we have a Y column, which is full of outputs. So once again, these are all, all ordered pairs, which we like. But once again, uh, you can see at, at the top here, if I put in four, I get negative one out. In 4, out negative 1. Now, the 3, 0 is fine, but down here, if I put in 4 again, I get out of 1. 
already, I don't know what I'm going to get out if I put in a four. You could say, well, you get negative one or one. That's true so far, but down here at the bottom, even worse, there's a third value that comes out when you put in a four. So is the relation a function? Again, on the assignment, you would just put no. And that is because you have different outputs for the same input, which would the input is four, the outputs is negative one, one, and two. So once again, some students, they see that the x's, we have a negative seven and a negative seven. They repeat. Some students automatically right there, like it automatically is not a function. No, that is not how you determine it. So here I'm going to put in a negative seven and out I'm going to get a one. Okay. So if I put in negative seven, I get out a one. That's very nice. Down here though, what you'll notice is that if you put in a negative seven, you get out the same positive one. So since these are the same, is the relation a function? Yes, it is. And again, the same idea here. I don't care about the five, two or six, one, because there's no other X's that are five or X's that matches six. The only X's that matched were the negative sevens, but the Y's match as well. So that makes this a function. That's not, that's not a negative one. That's a arrow. The other part of our objective says we have to be able to determine if a graph is a function. Okay, can, I can determine if relations are functions. We saw ordered pairs, we saw tables, and now graphs. So the graph, we will determine if it is a function using what we call the vertical line test. Vertical lines are straight up and down, so they look something like this one right here. And all we're going to do is take this vertical line, see if I can, come on, technology, there we go. So I'm going to take this vertical line and I'm just going to scan the graph. Okay, so scanning me, I'm just going to, I like to go from left to right, but you can go from right to left, it doesn't matter. Um, but what you're looking for is for the graph to ever go through the vertical line here more than once. Okay, so if I see that the graph touches this vertical line maybe up here and then down here, if I see it goes through it twice or more, not a function anymore. So that's just twice. Twice is the smallest amount for it not to be a function. If it only goes through it once ever, it is a function, okay? So twice on, on the assignment, you may see it go up to like maybe five times. It doesn't matter. It depends on how far you want to scan, but it only has to go through twice for it not to be a function. Um, and well, it doesn't have anything to do with the, like the straightness of the line. It can be curved. It can change directions. It can be a straight line. It doesn't matter. Um, what does matter is that we're just getting, we're going to scan it and see if it goes through more than once. That's it. Okay. So I don't care about straightness or the curviness of the lines. Let's look at this one right here. Is the graph a function? That's a good question for us math nerds. You guys probably don't like it though. So let's see if I can take this line. Here we go. Come on, technology. There we go. All right. So I see all the points on the graph. There are points on the graph, right? So remember, I don't care about curviness. I don't care if it's a straight line. I don't care if it's just points on a graph. So I'm going to scan this one. Boom. I, I've come to this first point, but it's only going through this line once. So I continue scanning there at the bottom. That's at negative four, negative two, still only one point on the line. I keep scanning. Some of you guys know where this is going. So at the bottom there, you can see it's, it's touching this line once. So I'm going to continue scanning. Boom. Now you can see I've got on this line, my vertical line, this point here and this one here, right? I've got red. So that's two locations. I've got this ordered pair at um, one, four. And then I've got this ordered pair at one, negative three. That's, that's touching my vertical line at the same time twice. So this one, is the graph a function? The answer, no. Now, you could think about this again. Can, can we make this a function? Well, if you were to take away this point or even move it, then you would, or you could do it this one. You could take it away or move it, and then uh, it, in certain locations, it would, make, uh, it would still make a function. But as it is right now, not a function. This is the same exact graph we just saw, same exact graph. But what it's asking for us to do is to remove a point to make this graph a function. Now, you could, you could move it in certain locations, and that would work. What we know is that these two points right here are what made this not a function. So it doesn't matter which one we get rid of. You just got to get rid of one of them. I choose this one.
Now, you may have chosen the bottom one, and that's fine. But as of right now, since I took away this, this point right here, it is a function. Because if I were to take a vertical line and scan this, let's go and do that. If I were to scan this now, see, once, once, once. See, again, since I took that point at the top away, it's only going through once. Same here. Now it's a function. I guess as an ordered pair, I took this one away. That was 1, 4. But if you wanted to take away 1, negative 3, that would be fine too. Okay, now this graph, pretty funky looking, right? It's a bunch of straight lines all on the graph, and that's fine. doesn't matter. All we got to do is take our vertical line and then scan this sucker. Okay, so let's do that. I got my vertical line. Come on, technology. There we go. So I'm going to scan from left to right. Some students like to go from right to left. You're going to get the same answer either way. I'm going to start on the left here. Scanning, it's good so far, right? I only see this graph going through once. And then I get over here, right here, boom. Now, I see it goes through this vertical line here and here. Uh, that's two points on my vertical line. That's no good. Now, if you had scanned from right to left, you would have gotten these two points, which would have given you the same answer. These two are on my vertical line. So this one, is it a function? Again, the answer here is no. The funkiness of this line, right? This, like we got these points here and these ones, doesn't matter. Do keep in mind though, is, is if one of these, like if this was an open circle, or, which we, I guess we'll talk about. If this was an open circle, it wouldn't be included. Uh, then it would be, yes, still a function. But we shouldn't encounter anything like that yet. Okay, so is this one a function? So remember, for, for the vertical line test, I don't care that this one's squiggly. I don't care that it's not linear. I don't care about that stuff. I'm just going to take my vertical line and then test this one, okay? So, yeah, there we go. So I'm going to scan this. Now, it's not, I don't even get to the graph till I get here. And right at the edge here, it's touching it twice. If I go in any further, it's touching in four times, okay? So let's highlight those. One, two, three, four. I don't even care that I know the exact locations of these. All I can see is that it's going through this vertical line test four times. Since it goes through more than once, is it a function? No, it is not. Since I have an iPad and I'm doing this, I'm, I got a straight line like this. Some students like to use a pencil. Some students like to use a paper. doesn't matter how you use it. Uh, some students don't need anything. They can just visually see that this is going to go through a vertical line more than once. Uh, it's up to you what you use as long as you can use a vertical line test. All right, so this graph right here, um, again, you may be able to tell if this is a function just the way that it looks. But I'm going to take my vertical line test and scan this, okay? So I'm going from left to right. So I, I come to the the line on the graph here. And then as I move to the right, it's going down on my vertical line. Now I get to the, this is called the vertex. But as I go further to the right, it goes back upwards. That doesn't matter. I don't care the curviness of the line or whatever, or the straightness of the line. All I care about is that it, as I scan this, and I can scan the other way as well, if I can. Well, sure, whatever. I can scan it this way as well. You can see that the graph is only going through that vertical line once at any time. Now, this would be true even, that means this pattern is going to continue even if there were arrows on this graph. None of that matters, okay? So, uh, and I know in the past it's probably true that you've had, you've seen math jerks that are like, oh, actually the line comes back this way. Now, don't expect anything like that from this class. So, this pattern is just going to continue. Is this a function? The answer is yes. Okay. Because, again, it's only going through my vertical line at any time once. So if domain is a list of the x values, like it says here, that's your inputs. Okay. And then your range is the list of the y values, which is your outputs. So if you were looking at an ordered pair, for all of your ordered pairs, you have an x value, and you got a y value. The x values are the domain values, which you would list with the fancy brackets and set notation. And then the y values, what we call the range. Now, you'll have to keep in mind, if by chance we see uh, that it's not just ordered pairs that are put on the graph, like a bunch of points, 
Maybe it's a line. Then we have to list the domain and range as an interval, which we have seen before and we loved so much. This, this is pretty much new vocabulary right here, domain and range. Maybe you've seen a little bit in eighth grade, but it's, it should be fairly new. So the domain, uh, if you look at ordered pair, <coughs> excuse me, ordered pairs, that's your X's, that's the domain, the range is the Y values. Uh, now, if, if they give you ordered pairs, that's great, but sometimes they'll, we'll see these as graphs with, with lines as well. So we'll have to see a way to do that. But first, here is, uh, we've seen this example already, but it's just asking for the domain and range, okay? So let's start with the domain. These are X values, right? Now, you may benefit from going through each of these ordered pairs and actually listing the values, which you could do. Uh, I'm talking about the ordered pairs, right? So this ordered pair right here, this would be, looks like negative 1, 2, 3, 4, negative 5, 2. And then I'll go from left to right. This one is uh, negative 4, negative 2. This one's negative 3, negative 5. Uh, do you have to list all these? No, you do not. But again, if it helps, which I hope it does, then do it. This one would be 1, negative 3. Remember, then we had this one at 1, 4, which is what made it not a function. Then we got 4, negative 1. Okay. So the domain, that's all my x values to start with, and I need fancy brackets, right? So I got my s and then a 2. It's not so fancy because I did it, but hopefully you can make that a little bit more pretty. Whatever. Uh, but I'm just looking at my x values. On the assignment, you're going to have to list these from least to greatest. So that means I would start as far to the left, and I'm going to start with left, and then move to the right for my x values, okay? Because you got to list these from least to greatest. And the first to the left I go is negative 5, so I'm going to list that here, negative 5. Then my next one, moving to the left there, is negative 4. And then negative 3, still moving to the left. Now what we end up with this, uh, with these next two points is the same x values of 1. Uh, and what students like to do, since this is new to us, is they like to list two ones. But if you do this and then a math nerd sees it, they may freak out. So don't list any values more than once, just once, uh, which hopefully is good for you because it means less writing. And then the last value furthest to the right here is an x value that's 4. Okay, so I have all these listed, but now I need to close my fancy brackets. There's a 2, and then an s, boom. So the range on this, which is just, that's all my y values for my range. Uh, but again, I need to list these values, so I need some fancy brackets. So there's an s, then a 2. And uh, since I need to list these from least to greatest, I've got to start at the bottom. And then I'm going to move up. Okay, so the furthest, the point that's furthest down is, I see a y value that's negative 5 there. So I'll list it, negative 5. And then moving up, I see this next one at negative 3. And then negative 2. Then negative 1. And then... The next one is 2, and then the highest one I have here is 4. Okay, so I'm just moving up, and I don't care that they're left and right. I'm just, I'm just kind of scanning this again, moving my way up until I find the points. So I've listed these out, and I've got to close my fancy brackets for my range. So there's a 2, then an S. Fancy brackets. Uh, so that's the domain and range. Now, you'll probably notice that my range has more values than my domain. That's because there was an x value that repeated, right? We had an x value of 1 and 1. We don't list that. We don't list repeating values more than once. If you do on the assignment or on a test, you'll be, you'll be docked points for that. So just keep that in mind. For this one, we have a bunch of ordered pairs. And my domain and range, I got a list from least to greatest. So my domain is my x values. And then my range is my corresponding y values. All right, so starting out, I've got x values of 3, negative 2, 6, and then I got a, a 3 that repeats, right, which is what made this one not a function. But for my domain, then, I need some fancy brackets. There's an s, then a 2. I'm going to open my fancy brackets. The lowest value that I see is negative 2. Okay, so I've used the negative 2. Uh, the, the only other two choices I have is 3 and 6, and 3 is definitely less than 6. So 3 and then 6. And I've used all of my x values. Again, the 3 repeats, but we don't show up more than once in a list for a domain and range. 
So I'll close my fancy brackets at two, then an S. That is my domain from least to greatest. The next is my range. I need some fancy brackets again. S and then a two. Open uh, my list notation for my range. My range has negative seven, eight, one, and negative four. Those are the corresponding Y values here. The smallest one I see is negative seven. So I'll list that first. And then I've got negative four. Remember this is least to greatest and then one. And then the last one we have is eight. Close this with some fancy brackets, a two, and then an S. That's it, domain and range. So we got the domain and range, again, domain, that is X values. And then the range is the Y values. So the domain on this one, again, fancy brackets, I got an S, then a two. Um, so again, from least to greatest, I've got a negative seven that repeats here and here. We're just looking at the X's, so negative seven is my lowest value. Then only two to choose from between five and six. Five is definitely lower than six, so five and then six. Then I will close this with fancy brackets, a two, then an S. So again, even though there's four ordered pairs here, I only have three X values because the negative seven repeats. Last up, the range, which is my Y values, and we have repeating values here as well. There's only two different values, the lowest of which is one. And again, even though there's three ones here, I only need to list it once in my range. And then the second Y value is a two. So close this off with fancy brackets, a two, then an S, done. So next up, we have interval notation. We have seen interval notation already, but it was with these square brackets. Okay, and I, I pointed that out earlier in the lesson. What you may also see is these parentheses like this. Parentheses tell us that a value is not included. Okay, so you may see this in an interval. An interval is a nice way to show a range of values in a, either a domain or range, which means that interval notation is really good for lines because we don't want to have to list all the X values or the, all the Y values because if you have any bit of line, there's an infinite number of values that you could put in as either your domain or range. So we have to show if they're included or not included, uh, which on a graph we'll show in the next slide. But um, yeah, we, we're not gonna see this today, but in later lessons for this unit, we'll see that some of the values, sometimes they'll go to negative infinity, maybe even positive infinity for our domain and range, okay? But uh, if we cross that bridge today, then we will, but I don't think that we will. So mostly we use interval notation to express the domain and range specifically for lines. Now on a line, which we've seen this already, if you, if you have a closed circle like this, then the value is included. If it's an open circle, then it's not included. So if it's included, you use square brackets. If it's not included, then you use parentheses like this, which I will indicate on the graphs that we look at in order to make our domain and range. Domain being the X values, which is left and right, and then range being the Y values, which is down and then up, okay? And it is always from left to right and then down, moving upwards. Find the domain and range. The domain, that's our X values. That means we're looking from left to right. Now again, with the domain and range, I don't care that it's curved, I don't care that it goes up or down. I don't care about that stuff. I just got to see how far left, <clears throat> excuse me, this, this graph goes, and then how far to the right. So the furthest point to the left is an open circle right here. That tells me that I'm going to be using a parentheses here on the left. So I'm going to start this with a set of parentheses, and then its corresponding x value here is negative 5. So this, goes, this graph goes as far to the left as negative 5, and then I'm going to put a comma here. That's not because it's an ordered pair, but because it's an interval, then this graph is going to go to the right all the way up this line to the closed circle. And a closed circle will have a square bracket. So I'm expecting a square bracket. But where does this end? For the x value, I just follow this, that line down, it ends at 1. Now again, this is not an ordered pair. This is an interval telling us that the domain is listed. It lists all the x values between negative 5 and 1. 
where negative 5 is not included, which is why we show this parentheses right here. Okay? So the domain is nice. That's left and right. The range, which is our y values, this one's going to be up and down. So I'll put down to up because we're going to start at the bottom. You always start with the bottom. Start with the lowest one, and then you're going to move up. So the range here, the lowest point I have, again, it's in open circles, so going up and down, that's going to be a parentheses there, so parentheses. What's that y value? Do I fall this over, and I get negative 3. Okay, so again, I'm going to go up the graph, and then I see the highest point that I have is still at this closed circle right here, uh, which is included because it's a closed circle, so I have a square bracket there at the very end. There's my comma, and what's that value for my y? That goes as high as a y value of three. Now again, this is not an inter this is not a ordered pair. It is an interval, so keep that in mind. It, it may have the parentheses, but this is as a range. It's showing an interval value. For this graph, the domain again. The domain is my x values. That's left to right. Okay, so the furthest left point that I have is this closed circle. Since it's a closed circle, I'm going to have a square bracket there, and that corresponding x value is negative 4. Now, I can follow this line as far to the right as I can go. It goes up and then down then back up. I don't care that it goes up, down, then up. I just want to see which value is furthest to the right, which is this closed circle. Now, since it's closed, it's going to be a square bracket at the end there. But its corresponding x value is 5. So this interval includes all the values between negative 4 and 5 for my x's. And then uh, since we got the square brackets there, it, that means the negative 4 and 5 are included in the domain. The range, we'll start at the bottom and then work our way up. Okay, so the, the point of the... First to the bottom is this one right here. Okay, now that's that's on the line, so it's included, and that's a y value of negative four. So that in, it's on the line, so it has to be part of the range, part of the function. And so this one it starts at negative four, and then moving up, the farthest point up that I see is this one right here. Again, it's on the line, so it's included. And that's a y value that's, uh, well, it'd be 0. So it goes from negative 4 to 0. Both of those are included. And that's it. So a mapping, I think we've seen this slide before, but a mapping right here is just showing us the ordered pairs with these lines, okay? So it means if, if you put in 0, you're going to get out 2, okay? Or if you put in 2, you're going to get out 6. If you put in 3, you're going to get out 8. 4 and 10, if you put in 1, you get out, get out of 4. So in other words... For a mapping, this is your input part of the map, which, of course, is your x values. And then the second side of the map is your output, which, of course, is your y values. So that's why over here in the table, you've got x's on the left and y's on the right. This table right here is exactly the same as this mapping because you have 0, 2, 1, 4, 2, 6, 3, 8, and 4, 10. 0, 2, 1, 4, 2, 6, 3, 8, 4, 10. So it doesn't matter if you show it as a table a table or a map. It doesn't matter. It is, it's communicating exactly the same thing. Now, we've seen how to tell if a table is a function, but not if a mapping is a function. So when are mappings functions? That's not very eloquent, but if you look, if you look over here at your inputs, as long as there's only one arrow coming out of it, every one of these inputs, it is a function. Now, it doesn't matter where it points. So you could have some arrows that cross up here. That doesn't matter. What you're looking for is just two arrows coming out of any one of these. If you have two arrows coming out of it or more, then it's not a function. So this one, in order for it to be a function, you can only have one arrow coming out of each of the, of the inputs or the x values. So let's say that we had... Uh, a mapping over here like this. If I had a number like negative 3, but then I had two arrows coming out of it, even though there may be other, and I don't care where it points to, by the way, 
But if there were other values here for my input, it wouldn't matter. This would represent not a function. So you don't really have to look at the, the output, the y values. You're just looking at the input, seeing if there's two arrows coming out of it or more, then it's not a function. Because, yeah, that, that negative 3, if there were more arrows coming out of it, it's still not a function. Okay. But again, I can't stress this enough. Some students get mixed up if they see arrows crossing over each other. That doesn't matter. You're just looking for two or more arrows coming out of one of the inputs. Okay, so this one, is it a function? So again, I, I don't really care what's in my um, output right here. I just see that all of my inputs only have one arrow coming out of each, coming out of each of these inputs. So automatically, this one is a function. I would put yes. Okay, and then we need the domain and range. So the domain, this one, it got kind of mixed up, but my domain is my inputs, the x values. Uh, but again, you need this from least to greatest. So the least one there is negative 6, then negative 2, then 3, then 4. Okay, so I have four different values in my domain. You'll notice that two different arrows are pointing at 5 for my... Uh, y values or my output, um, that does not affect whether it's a function or not. Uh, what it does affect is how many values are in the range, okay? But this would be an ordered pair of 4, 5. This would be an ordered pair of negative 6, 5. Okay, so we can list, list those as well. So you, you would have uh, 4, 5. You'd have negative 6, 5. Then you'd also, it looks like we have the pair 3, 3. And then we got the pair negative 2, 4. So could you make a table out of this? Of course you could. Uh, but again, even though these lines cross over each other, it doesn't matter. This one is still a function. So now we're ready for the range, which is the set of y values. That's our output. So s then 2 to open this parentheses. The lowest value is 3, then 4, then 5. Close this with a 2, then an s. Fancy brackets. There it is. So this one, again, let's just determine if this is a function or not. Well, I see two arrows coming out of negative 2. So this one right off the bat, not a function. So again, on the assignment, it's going to say, is it a, a function? You just put no for that. Okay, so we have that. Let's list the domain. That's my x values or the inputs. So that's this part of the mapping, the left column, I guess. So the domain, fancy brackets, s then a 2. The smallest value I see there is negative 2, then 0, then 1, then 3. So to close off my fancy brackets, there's a 2, then an s. Fancy brackets, okay? All right, my range, that's my y values, which again is the right column. And the lowest range value I have, let's open this up. S, then a 2. Uh, the lowest one I see is negative 7. And then I got a 1, and then a 4. So we'll close this fancy bracket, so 2, then an S. Now again, just, just to emphasize this, um, you could make a table out of this as well. So last time we showed ordered pairs on the last problem. This one is going to have X's and Y's. First ordered pair I see is 3, 1. I'm just going to work my way down. Then I've got negative 2, negative 7. Then we've got negative 2 pointing at 4. And then 1 pointing at 4. So again, if, if making the table like this as well helps you, where you see that the two x values are the same, negative 2s, but they put out something different, then make it a table if it helps, okay? But again, this one's still not a function. This one, create a mapping for this relationship. So I got... Uh, I'm going to have two columns. I'm just going to work my way. Uh, let's look at all the x values first, actually. So you don't have to. Like, you could say, well, negative 12, and then you got the output of 7 from this one. Again, you just have an arrow that points to it, right? So that represents that ordered pair, negative 12, 7. And then, yeah, we got the 13 and the negative 10, right? So I got a 13, which is going to point at the negative 10 with an arrow like this. And yeah, I don't really need this in any specific order. The next ordered pair starts with a 4, and then out comes a 2, 
input four, outcome two. So input eight for the next one. And then out comes a negative nine. So eight, negative nine. And then this last one, we have negative 13, which I'm going to put down here. But we've already put negative 10 in the, uh, in the y values there. So I'm just going to take an arrow and I'm going to cross all the other ones back up to negative 10. Like this. And that creates the mapping. The last thing we need on this is the domain and the range. We'll start with the domain, which is the list of the x values. We'll list this from least to greatest, so s then a 2. I guess I've done better than that, but the lowest one I see there is negative 13, then negative 12, then 4, then 8, and then the biggest x value that we have is 13. So we'll close the fancy brackets, a 2, then an s, and there it is. Now this one was a function, which we've already seen. But um, well, we know that because there's only one arrow coming out of each of the values, right? Now let's get on to the range, which is a list of all of the y values. And again, there's only four y values, whereas there's five x values because there's two arrows pointing to the negative 10, and that's okay. So the smallest value is negative 10, the least value, and then the next least would be negative 9, and then 2, and then positive 7. That is a list of the values in the range, a two then an S, finishes off the fancy brackets, and we have completed this problem. We created the mapping like this. And by the way, I put them in this order just because I went from left to right in the ordered pairs, but you could have listed these in order from least to greatest, and then just made sure that uh, even these ones from least to greatest, and then made sure that they were pointing in the correct direction to make ordered pairs as we go, right? Because remember, like this one right here, this would have been the ordered pair negative 12, seven, uh, and then the next one, I would say, would have been 13, negative 10, even though you could have said it was negative 13, negative 10 as well. And then we had uh, 4, 2, and then 8, negative 9. So again, th this is not in the same order just because I was going off the arrows and I was going down as I went. But these are the same ordered pairs that are in this list, all five of them, all five of them, done. So there's our two objectives again. I can find domain and range from maps, graphs, ordered pairs, and tables. But also we, be able, we have to be able to find uh, or determine if a relation is a function and it is based off the same maps, graphs, ordered pairs, and tables.